Okay, so chapter 10 is all about muscle tissue. If you're trying to see sort of a theme here, uh, you know, we started way back in chapter one with just what is anatomy and physiology. Then we moved on to cells and learning about them. And then we went on to tissues and classifying different kinds of tissues. And then finally, organs, where we got the skin, right, the outermost layer of the body, moved then to um, identifying bones and talking about how bones move at joints and talking about, like, the levers, the different kinds um, of, of how movement is made. And now we're talking about muscles, which actually do that movement. So here are our objectives. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but basically in the same way that the bone uh, skeletal system had some of these objectives that you will focus more on in your lab, same thing here, like exactly where muscles begin and insert into the skeleton, a lot of that is going to be in the lab. But the, the structure and the how does a muscle excite and contract and relax, um, that is going to be in, in our lecture here. Not that it's not important to know how and where and what these muscles are. Um, it's just sort of split up between lecture and lab. So as you're going through this, just know some of these will be things that you look at in your lab course. So, as always, what is the purpose or the function of skeletal muscles? First and foremost, it is for body movement. It moves the bones. It's what lets us make facial expressions. It's what lets us speak and breathe and swallow and do motion at all. It's also important for maintaining our posture. It stabilizes our joints and keeps us upright. It acts as protection and support. That's what's packaging our internal organs and keeping them in place. It's helping to regulate elimination of materials. We've got sphincter muscles that control passageways at or orifices, so things going in and out. And also heat production, so it helps us to maintain a constant body temperature. Some characteristics that we need to know about in general for our muscle cells is that they are excitable. They have this ability to respond to stimuli or change um, their electrical membrane potential. They are conductive. That means that they can send electrical charge down the length of the cell membrane. They are contractile, meaning that they um, have filaments that can slide past each other, which is what is causing movement. They are extensible, which means they have the ability to be stretched. And they are elastic, meaning that they have the ability to return to their original length after they lengthen or shorten. Of course, each skeletal muscle is considered an organ because it's multiple types of tissue working together. You've got skeletal muscles, connective tissue, blood vessels, and nerves all in our skeletal system. The muscle fibers are bunched or bundled together within a fascicle. A whole muscle has many fascicles, and each fascicle is going to consist of muscle fibers. A muscle fiber is a muscle cell. So they're sometimes used as interchangeable things. A muscle fiber is a muscle cell. What are our connective tissues? Well, we've got three layers um, that are, are wrapping up our fascicles. And so we've got the epimyosin that's going to be dense, irregular connective tissue that wraps the whole muscle. And you'll see a picture in just a moment. Then you've got your perimyosin, which is also dense, irregular connective tissue that is going to wrap a fascicle. And that is going to be where we find blood vessels and nerves. Then you have the endomyosin, which is areolar connective tissue, wrapping each fiber. 
And this is a very delicate layer, but it's important for electrical insulation, for capillaries to get to and from each of the cells, and for it to stick to the other cells around it. So here's what we're talking about with that. So you've got this bone here and we've got a tendon and the tendon connects to a muscle. Here's our muscle. And on the outside of it is that epimyosin. Uh, if we look, here is our perimyosin around these fascicles. And then if we look at each individual um, fiber here, that's where we're going to see our endomyosin. Okay, let's continue talking about some of these connective tissue components. Um, of course, we have to attach this muscle to bone or skin or other muscles in some way. And so the main way that we're going to do that is through a tendon. That's the one you definitely want to know about. That is a cord-like structure of dense, regular connective tissue. You can also have an aponeurosis, which is a flat, thin sheet of dense, irregular tissue. Not as important for our purposes as tendons, but still there. We have what we call the deep, deep fascia. That is dense, irregular connective tissue that is superficial to the epimyosin. And that is going to separate individual muscles, bind muscles that do the same job together. And then you've got superficial fascia, which is areolar and adipose connective tissue. It's superficial or above the deep fascia, and it's what's separating your muscles from your skin. We do have blood vessels and nerves going to skeletal muscle. So the skeletal muscle is vascularized. It has extensive blood vessels. It has the job of delivering oxygen and nutrients and removing waste products. Um, our skeletal muscle is also innervated um, by somatic nerves. So there are axons of neurons that branch and terminate at a place we call the neuromuscular junction. And that is where we're actually going to be um, releasing and absorbing the different um, chemicals in order to um, cause a, an action of the muscle. And because we are um, able to have this neuromuscular junction, we can have voluntary control of when the muscles are contracted for some of our uh, muscles. Okay. Let's now look at an individual muscle cell or a muscle fiber. We have some special terms for these special cells. The first is the sarcoplasm, which is just another word for the cytoplasm inside of a muscle fiber. The sarcoplasm is going to have typical organelles that you would find in cells but also it has contractile proteins. And there are other specializations that we're going to go through that the sarcoplasm has. A muscle fiber also is going to have multiple nuclei, um, or we say individual cells are multinucleated. The cell is formed um, in embryo when there are multiple myoblasts that fuse together. Some of the nearby myoblasts can become undifferentiated satellite cells that repair and support our muscle fiber or our muscle cells. We have what we call a sarcolemma. That's the plasma membrane. The sarcolemma has something we call T-tubules or transverse tubules that go deep into the cell. That sarcolemma and its T-tubules have these voltage-gated ion channels. Think of them like little doors that are going to allow the cell to conduct electrical signals. We also have voltage-sensitive sensi calcium channels that are responsive to the electrical signals or help create this action potential. 
So here again, you can imagine from this picture, the picture before where you've got the bone with the tendon to the muscle. Okay, we've got our muscle, we have a fascia, uh, and then we're looking at the individual muscle fiber, and here's what we're seeing. So you've got your um, organelles, like we call them a sarcoplasmic reticulum, just like it would be an endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, um, you've got your sarcolemma or the plasma membrane, and then you have each individual myofibril um, and each of these little filaments to create your muscle cell where you've got your T tubules that go deep into the cell in order to conduct electricity across it. Okay, myofibrils, what are those? We can have hundreds, if not thousands, in each cell. They are just bundles of myofilaments that are wrapped up in that sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is this internal membrane that is an awful lot like the endoplasmic reticulum. Within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you have something called terminal cisternae. And that terminal cisternae is going to uh, bind these sacs of sarcoplasmic reticulum. They're the place where we have extra calcium ions. Um, and two of these uh, cisterna with the T-tubule in between is called a triad. Much like our last chapter, there is a lot of vocabulary, but once you get the vocabulary set, things start to make more sense. Um, this sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to be where you have calcium pumps that bring calcium in. It's not incredibly important that you know this next step, but calcium is going to bind to calmodulin and calcosequestrin. Um, and then basically there will be release channels and they are triggered by electrical signals moving down the T-tubule. And the main thing that will happen is the calcium that's been held onto will be released into the sarcoplasm. Here's that triad more closely um, where you've got your T-tubule and you've got in between here this um, voltage sensitive calcium channel. So from the cytosol, you are able to to sort of pump out um, these uh, calcium ions. They'll also fall back in through this calcium pump where we're able to grab onto them with that calmodulin and cal uh, sequestrin. So we're, we're holding on to them until we want to pump them back out of um, into the cytosol. Okay. Myofilaments are contractile proteins that are inside the myofibrils, okay? And there are two kinds. There are the thick filaments, which are bundles of many myosin protein molecules. This myosin head points towards the end of the filament. And then there are thin filaments, which are bundles of um, myosin protein molecules. Okay, but they're twisted um, and they have this strand of F actin and each F actin has a G actin. G actin is a myosin binding site where the myosin will actually attach. And uh, tropomyosin and troponin are present and they are the regulatory proteins. Again, all of those vocabulary words probably sound a little crazy but let's take a look here. So you've got your muscle fiber, you've got your myofibrils, all of the little filaments are in here. If we were to then take a look at these filaments, we would see that we've got this little head piece here where um, ATP can bind. This is our actin binding. Okay, this is the, the head region. And then we've got this tail. If we were then to sort of um, look at this um, larger, we would see that the myosin heads point towards 
the end of the, the filament. Okay, and then in our thin filament, we've got tropomyosin and troponin. We can see that this is this little calcium binding site. And we also have this myosin binding site. So these little head structures can bind. How is this all arranged? Well, myofilaments are arranged in a repeating pattern or a repeating unit called a sacromere. And this is going to be composed of overlapping thick and thin filaments. So we're going to have both together overlapping. We can split this up or delineate it at the ends by what we call Z disks. And this Z disk area is just specialized proteins that go perpendicular to the myofilaments. They are going to act as the anchoring point for the thin filaments. When you look at this under a microscope, the position of the thin and thick filaments give us what we look at as alternating I band and A band. Don't worry, there will be a picture. Um, when we're looking at I bands, those are going to be the light colored region and they only have thin filaments. And they're kind of cut or bisected by the Z disc. These I bands will get smaller or even disappear when the muscle contracts. The A band is the darker region and it has thick filaments of overlapping uh, thin filaments. It has what we call the H zone and the M line. And this is going to make up the center or central region of our sacromere. The H zone is in the middle of the A band. That's where only thick filaments are, are represented. Um, and that will disappear when we contract the muscle as well. And then the M line is the middle of that zone. And this is really just an attachment site for the thick filaments. So again, we have our muscle fiber. We're pulling out this one filament. And if we looked at it, we have this um, little structure that repeats. We've got our Z disc um, over here. That's the ends where we have our I band as well. We've got our A band with our thick filaments um, with the H zone and the M line right in the middle. Here's what it looks like if you zoomed in even more. So you've got this Z disc, this nice little area to connect our uh, filaments to. And this area here, that's our I band and it is mirrored on the other side. In the middle is our A band. This inside region where we just have these thick filaments is the H zone and right in the middle of that is the M line. From our Z disc to our Z disc, that is our sarcomere. What does this look like as a cross section? Um, well, let's look. M line, that is thick filaments only and it is directly in the middle. H zone has our thick filaments, but no accessory proteins, no network. A band is this overlapping thick and thin filament section. I band is thin filaments with connectin. And the Z disc is the thin filaments, connectin, and accessory proteins making this network. Why is any of that important? Um, well, this is going to be how this muscle can contract. So we need these structural proteins as well to help us do that. The first is connectin. It's going to go from the Z disc to the M line. And it is going to be stabilizing the thick filaments. It has these spring-like properties um, or what we call passive tension. There's also something called dystrophin, which is going to anchor myofibrils to the sarcolemma proteins. If there is an abnormality in dystrophin, you get muscular dystrophy. 
So muscular dystrophy is just this collective term for hereditary diseases where the skeletal muscles degenerate. Specifically, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is the most common. This is when we have defective or insufficient dystrophin. When we don't have dystrophin as that accessory protein to help connect, um, we will actually damage the sarcolemma when the muscle contracts. Calcium will enter the cells and damage the proteins. So we get problems starting in early childhood with walking, muscle atrophy, uh, poor posture, and um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is currently incurable and patients rarely live beyond the age of 30. Okay, again, we're learning all of these little parts and pieces because um, we want to contract this muscle. And when we're doing that contraction, we should realize that we need energy. So mitochondria and other structures required for energy production are present in these muscles. Um, there's abundant mitochondria in each of the fibers to do aerobic ATP production. We have myoglobin in the cells that allows storage of oxygen that we need to do this uh, cell respiration. Glycogen is stored uh, for when fuel is needed quickly. And then creatine phosphate can give us um, a phosphate group if we need phosphate quickly to keep making ATP. So how is this going to work? Um, we call a motor neuron and the muscles that it controls a motor unit. Okay, So we will need nerves in order to make these muscles contract. The axons of the motor neurons from the spinal cord or the brain go into many muscle fibers. The number of fibers a neuron innervates will vary. Small motor units have less than five muscle fibers. That's allowing for precise control. Um, large motor units can have thousands, and that's for more um, large amount of force, but not precision. The fibers of the motor unit um, can be dispersed throughout the muscle. They're not just in one little area. It's, it's throughout. At this area, we have the synaptic knob, and that's just going to be this expanded tip on the motor neuron. It's going to be where we have synaptic vesicles that are going to be filled with acetylcholine. There is a calcium ion pump in the plasma membrane, which is going to make more outside of the neuron. So now we have this action potential, this, this stored energy, because we have more calcium outside of the neuron. There is this voltage-gated channel that will allow the calcium to flow into the cell down its gradient when the channel opens up. Uh, there is this motor end plate, which is on the muscle fiber, on a region of the sarcolemma, uh, and it has a lot of folds in it. This is a place where there are acetylcholine receptors. There's this plasma membrane with protein channels. It's only going to open when it's binding with acetylcholine. This binding is going to let sodium and potassium leave the cell. And then there's a little gap in between, um, which is what is our neuromuscular junction. It is called the synaptic clef, cleft, and it is going to be where acetylcholine esterase is at. That's the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine molecules. So what is happening here? You've got your muscle fiber. You've got your nerves. There's this small gap here, that synaptic cleft, that essentially what happens is a nerve signal will come through. It is going to release this acetylcholine that can then be taken up 
um, at the receptors here on the muscle fiber. And then of course, um, that is going to open channels to release the sodium and the potassium. The location where this um, motor neuron innervates the muscle is usually the mid region of the fiber, um, but it can sort of go throughout. Um, so just keep that in mind. Here's a close up here um, where we are looking at the nerve, looking at the cleft, looking here at the muscle fiber. Um, we are releasing this acetylcholine, which is being taken in by receptors. When we do that, we are able to um, then open these channels for the sodium and potassium to move. So muscle fibers, um, when they are at rest, they do have a resting membrane potential. They have this because the fluid inside the cell is more negative compared to the fluid outside of the cell. And we can actually measure this with a millivolt reader and it's about negative 90 millivolts. The resting membrane potential is established by what we call leak channels for um, all intensive purposes for us. That's just channels that allow some ions to move in and out and this sodium potassium pump, which are voltage gated. They're not going to um, be always open. They will only open when excited by an electrical pulse that tells them that they should release um, ions. When we look at this more specifically, calcium getting in at the synaptic knob, the nerve signal will travel down the axon that nerve signal will open voltage gated calcium channels. Calcium will move out into the synaptic knob and it will bind to proteins on the surface of the synaptic vesicles. How do we release acetylcholine? Uh, vesicles will merge with the cell membrane. Um, exocytosis will happen and we will release acetylcholine um, out into the synaptic cleft. So here is that happening. So we've got our nerve. That nerve signal is coming. When we excite this neuron, we've got our calcium channels opening here. And um, they are coming in. They are binding onto these vesicles. The vesicles are going to the edge of the neuron. Um, exocytosis is happening and acetylcholine is being released. Acetylcholine is binding to the muscle cell and it is opening its channels. So when that's happening, the uh, stimulation of the fiber is also working with the sliding of filaments. So putting this filament sliding back and forth with this neuron is making what we call an end plate potential or a muscle action potential. And so when we are releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this is what is happening as well. So what is this end plate potential all about? Well, acetylcholine receptors are chemically gated channels and they're only going to open if acetylcholine binds to them. Sodium will move uh, into the cell through the channels and um, the potassium will come out. When that happens, the membrane is gonna become less negative at the end plate region. And um, while the end plate is, is local, it does lead to the opening down the line. So it, we're essentially moving that negative charge down the length of the cell because of the opening of those channels and the diffusion of sodium um, through the channels 
into the cell with a little bit of potassium going out. We're making an exchange of ions to make it more negative and move down the cell. How does this all work? Um, I know this is a lot. There are many videos that I've shared with you, but I want you to get the vocabulary under your belt before you start to dive more deeply into what is happening in the video. But we've got to start that propagation of action potential. So that action potential is just the quick depolarization. And then we want to bring it back up to that resting potential. When we've got that end plate potential at its threshold, it's going to cause the uh, voltage gated channels next to it to open. Sodium will diffuse into the cell. Potassium will leak out of the cell and the cell will depolarize or become less negative. Eventually, we'll get a membrane um, millivolt reading of plus 30. So we went from negative 90 to plus 30. When we get to that point, um, we are then going to open the adjacent sodium channels and even more sodium comes in. And this is really just a chain reaction that once one of these channels reaches its threshold, the ones next to it open. So we're just moving this um, changing of electron or of um, ions down the cell. After the sodium channels open, they close. Okay, and then there is a voltage gate gated potassium channel. When this channel opens, potassium can leave the cell. And the cell is going to what we call repolarize. That potassium channel opening lets us go back to 90 millivolts. So we started at 90 millivolts, we went to positive 30, and now we're back down to negative 90. While the cell is at that positive 30 millivolt reading, it cannot keep passing that down. It needs to recover. So that's why we want to then shut the calcium channels, open the potassium channels, and let it repolarize. What does that look like in a graph? So you're at your resting potential. We have that neuron being excited. We have acetylcholine being released. We have those channels opening for calcium. All of that's happening right there. We have our um, peak point here where we now have gone to that positive 30 millivolts. And now our channels have shut down and we're opening the potassium channels. That will bring us back down to our uh, initial reading of negative 90 millivolts. So as that action potential is moving down the T tubules, this is causing a voltage sensitive calcium channel uh, to open and release calcium. The release of calcium comes from the sarcoplasmic <laughs> reticulum and that is what is going to interact and cause contraction. So really all of what we just did with these different ions and the neurons and all of that was to get a muscle to contract. Calcium binds to tri troponin. This is going to trigger what we call cross bridge cycling. And basically, very simply, troponin and tropomyosin move, so actin is exposed. We've got this binding, so we are sort of flicking our little uh, filament, our myosin filament, so that we can have a contraction and then a relaxation. How does this happen? 
This is going to be four repeating steps. Step one, we have what we call the cross bridge formation. Myosin is going to attach to this binding site on actin. We have what we call the power stroke, that's the little flick, where myosin heads pull thin filaments towards the center of the sacromere. We are using ATP to do that, so we release ADP and phosphorus. The myosin head lets go. When that happens, ATP binds to the myosin head and it will release from actin. Then it is reset and we can do it again. And this is a picture that comes from your book showing you that. We've taken this little section right here where we have the overlap of our thin and thick filament and we show you that we've got these calcium ions attaching here to our troponin. Um, we've got our myosin heads attaching um, here to where um, to the filaments and then we've got our power stroke our little flick in which we use ATP to do that a new ATP will bind and then the um, filament will let go and we can do this again this is going to be in a cycle because as long as there is calcium and ATP, we can have the shortening of these Z discs, moving them closer together, or what we call contracting. We will see that the H zone and the I band will disappear, or at least narrow. Our thick and thin filaments remain the same length, but they're sliding past each other. So they're sort of just shrinking in the overall length while the uh, filament itself is still the same. So here's, here's what we mean. You've got your thin and your thick filaments arranged. We have our calcium channels are opening and our actin is working. Um, when we see that happening, we're, we're crossing or sh like sliding past each other the thin and thick filaments. So when you relax your muscle, this is the normal state. This is what it looks like. When you um, contract your muscle, we don't change the length. We just uh, bend them over one another. So why should we care about any of this? Well, we've got um, some different paralyses and neurotoxins that will affect the ability for your muscles to contract. The first being tetanus. That's called spastic paralysis. It's caused from a bacteria called Clostridium tetanii. It is going to block the inhibitory neurotransmitter in your spinal cord, so your muscles are overstimulated. Um, so basically, it's constantly sending acetylcholine into that synaptic cleft, constantly having those calcium channels open, and that can be life-threatening for that overstimulation of your muscles. So you can get a vaccine to prevent this. Uh, botulism is muscle paralysis from Clostridium uh, botulinum, and that is going to prevent the acetylcholine from being released. So then if it doesn't get released, then you will not open the calcium channels, you will not have the filament slide past each other, you will not have contraction. So while it is toxic to ingest it, if you can do careful injections, um, then you can uh, help treat cerebral palsy and it's used uh, cosmetically to dis diminish wrinkles. Okay, so now we just did all of that to see how a muscle contracts. All the action potential, end plate potential, acetylcholine, neurons, all of that to get the muscle to contract. Now that it's contracted, how do we do the opposite? 
Well, first, there's going to have to be the termination of the nerve signal. So the nerve stops firing down to the muscle fiber. When that happens, we're going to then stop acetylcholine from being released. Then we have the hydrolysis of acetylcholine by acetylcholine esterase. So an enzyme will break down any acetylcholine that is left over in that synaptic cleft. We're going to close acetylcholine receptors so that we don't have them still attaching um, to the end plate. We have no further action potential generation, so we're not changing that negative 90 millivolts to be more positive. We, we don't do that. We'll close the calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We return extra calcium to the sarcoplasmic reticulum through some pumps. Troponin will go back to its original shape. Tropomyosin um, will block the actin's myosin binding sites. And then the muscle will return to its original position because it has the characteristic of um, elasticity. So to do this, you've seen that we need energy. We need ATP, right? We have to bind that to our filaments. Well, muscles only have a little bit of ATP stored in them. They've got about five seconds of intense exertion. Additional ATP can be made with something called myokinase, which is going to take a phosphate um, from one ADP to make an ATP. The other way that we can do this is through creatine phosphate. We can use the phosphate from there. We can do glycolysis if we do not have oxygen present um, or aerobic cellular respiration. We know that there are a lot of mitochondria in our muscle cells, um, so it can do cell respiration if the conditions are right. First, with the creatine phosphate, um, that is a very high energy level bond between creatine and phosphate, obviously. And the phosphate can be transferred to ADP to make ATP. And there's an enzyme that is called creatine kinase that will do this. So we already know we've got five seconds already stored doing this um, switch of creatine phosphate to release that phosphorus to make ATP, that will give you about 10 to 15 more seconds of energy. Glycolysis, that's not requiring oxygen. The glucose um, that we find in a muscle cell or in the blood is made into two pyruvate molecules. Then we get two ATP from each of those glucose molecules happening in the cytosol. That's going to give us some more energy, but really not that much for the amount of work put in. Aerobic cellular respiration, that does require oxygen. It's going to happen in the mitochondria where you're taking the pyruvate, um, you're releasing carbon dioxide, you're using high energy protein or proton acceptors in NADH and FADH2 to go down the electron transport chain and make 30 ATP. This is nice because you can also use triglycerides to make ATP. Um, it'll be fatty acids and it will go um, into the um, um, cellular respiration um, and just be broken down as if it were like glucose. It goes in in the Krebs cycle. So here's all of that that's happening. You've got your muscle fiber. You've got a blood vessel bringing us glucose. Inside that muscle fiber, we can be doing our Krebs cycle, or citric acid cycle in the mitochondria to make energy. While we're doing this, we can form lactate, which is not good for 
your muscle cells to accumulate. So basically the pyruvate that you get is going to turn into this lactate when there is low oxygen. Pyruvate is then converted to, um, into lactate by lactate dehydrogenase. Lactate can be used by fuel um, or used as fuel or enter the blood and be taken up by cardiac muscle or the liver. There is a lactic acid cycle in which you're taking lactate um, and it's being converted to glucose. And then the transport of glucose is going back to the muscles so that you can then make ATP. So how much energy are we even making here? So if you're trying to run a 50 meter sprint, less than 10 seconds, um, that ATP is mostly by transferring that phosphate from the creatine. If you're trying to do a 400 meter sprint, about a minute or less, um, that is going to be glycolysis after the first few seconds. If you're trying to run more than a minute, like you're maybe trying to do like a mile, that is going to need ATP that is primarily by aerobic processes after the first minute. And here is just a cute little diagram of a track showing you how you are getting this energy to your muscles. As you can see, you need an oxygen rich environment in which to do this work. So your body will have what we call an oxygen debt. And that is the amount of oxygen needed after exercise to restore back to pre-exercise conditions. Why do you need extra oxygen? Well, you have to replace oxygen that was on hemoglobin and myoglobin. You have to replenish your glycogen. You have to replenish ATP and the creatine phosphate. And you want to convert lactic acid back to glucose. Okay, so when we're looking at muscles, we have to classify their muscle fibers based on a few things. What type of contraction is generated and how do they get the ATP? So there are differences in the power, the speed, and the duration in which this contraction can be generated. Power is related to the diameter of the muscle fiber. Speed and duration has to do with an enzyme called myosin ATPase. And that is um, also the quickness of that action potential, like how fast does it spread? How fast can you release the calcium ions and how fast can you take them back in? We have what we call fast twitch fibers, which are more powerful and have a quicker but brief contraction compared to slow twitch fibers. You also have to classify it based on how it gets the ATP. If you have oxidative fibers, they're fatigue resistant. They're using aerobic cellular respiration. They have a lot of capillaries, they have a lot of mitochondria, they have myoglobin going to them. They look like red fibers and we call them red fibers. Glycolytic fibers are fatigable fibers. They are going to rely on anaerobic respiration. They don't have many capillaries, they don't have many mitochondria, they just have a little bit of myoglobin but they're storing glycogen for this purpose. They are going to look like white fibers and we call them white fibers. When we put this all together, we have a classification system where you can have one, a slow oxidative fiber. Contractions are slow and less powerful. 
There's high endurance in them because of the ATP being supplied by cellular respiration. They're about half the diameter of other fibers and they are red. Type 2 is going to be faxed oxidative fibers. Contractions are fast and powerful. They have aerobic respiration providing their ATP and they are intermediate in size and they're sort of light red or pink colored. Then you've got this fast uh, glycotic fibers which are fast and powerful. The contractions are very brief. ATP is through glycolysis. They are large in size and they are white because they don't have myoglobin. To get a single muscle, um, or I guess a single muscle contains all of those types of fibers um, in some mix, okay? And the variations of what type of fiber is there is what gives us different muscle groups. For example, your hand muscles have a lot of the fast glycotic fibers because they're quick. Your back muscles have the slow fibers because you have to maintain a posture. If we're looking at athletes, long distance runners have a higher proportion of the slow fibers in their legs, where spl sprinters have the fast glycotic fibers. And this can be determined primarily by your genetics, but also by training. So if you're training to run a marathon, you are training your body um, or you're changing your body to contain more of those slow oxidative fibers in your legs. And this is what we mean by that. And you will not have to like label them, but here's our fast glycotic, here's our slow oxidative, fast oxidative, fast glycotic. So they will look different between this dark red, pink, um, and, and white color fiber. In each of these muscles, um, there's a mix. And it's again determined by your genes as well as by practice and training. So in a lab, there were, have been many studies on muscle tension. And tension is just the force that's generated when the muscle is stimulated to contract. And they will map it out on what we call a myogram, where there's really no um, tension. The stimulus is elicited. You have this latent period where we are releasing those different chemicals in order to contract. You've got your contraction, and then there is this relaxation period before we could stimuli or send a stimuli again. A twitch is just a very brief contraction to a single stimuli. It's the minimum volt voltage that's required to reach a threshold. You've got your latent period, that's the time after the stimulus, but before the contraction. You've got contraction, the time when the, the tension increases. That's when you've got your power strokes in your thin filaments. And then the relaxed relaxation period, that is when the tension decreases back to baseline. That's when you have your cross bridges. And generally, it's a little bit longer than the contraction time. You can have muscles that are um, stimulated repeatedly, and then as the voltage increase, more units are recruited to contract. And we can call this recruitment multiple motor unit summation. And that's really how we can explain that muscles can have varying degrees of force. So it doesn't take very many motor neurons to move a pencil but you'll need to recruit more motor neurons to lift up your heavy suitcase. Once you get to a certain voltage and all of the units are recruited to work, you are at this maximum contraction and no matter how much more you increase the voltage, it's not going to do anything. And we recruit 
based on the size of the motor unit. So you'll go with the small motor units first, the largest last. And that's really sort of what we're, we're seeing in these graphs that come from your text. Um, we're increasing the voltage and we're getting a contraction and then we increase and we're getting a contraction, increase, increase, increase. But now if we look at this graph, all of the intensity of contraction is the same. So we've reached a point where no matter how much more we up the voltage, we're not getting a stronger contraction. It's the same. When we look at these graphs, we can um, categorize them by how they look um, in a few different ways. First, we have wave summation. If the stimulus frequency is about every 20 seconds, so every 20 seconds we are, are wanting that muscle to fire, um, we never really get complete relaxation between the twitches. And when that happens, the contractile forces add up and get higher tension. We can have incomplete tetany or and tetany where if the frequency is increased further, then we get what we call incomplete tetany. The tension increases and the twitches fuse together. If we have about 40 to 50 per second, um, then we have total tetany where it's a smooth line and there's no relaxation. And when we do that, we can lead to fatigue, which is decreased tension production in the muscle. So here's what we mean by that. We've got tension, relaxation, tension, relaxation, tension, relaxation, tension, relaxation, okay? That is less than uh, 10 per second stimuli. Then if we're doing 20 to 50 stimuli per second, we're building, we're building, we're building, we're building. Now we have this constant um, reaction from our muscle until we reach fatigue. So what is this muscle tone? What is this fatigue? What does this all have to do with something? Uh, muscle tone is just the resting tension in your muscle. This is generated by involuntary nervous stimulation. Randomly, some of your motor units are being stimulated at any point in time. This is constantly changing which units so you're not feeling fatigue. And you're not really generating enough tension to cause any kind of movement. When you're sleeping, this is going to decrease. We have what you call an isometric contraction that tension is increased and it's insufficient to overcome resistance. So the muscle is going to stay the same length. So that's just like holding a weight, but um, your arm doesn't move. Then you've got an isotonic contraction where muscle tension overcomes the resistance and it does result in movement. The tone is going to stay constant. The length of that muscle changes. And in that, you can have concentric contraction where the muscle shortens, like when your biceps, when you're lifting a load, um, or it's going to be when it lengthens, like when a bicep is lowering a load. So here's what we mean by this, like here's someone holding a baby as they brought that baby up to their face, um, that is an isometric contraction. Meanwhile, as you let the baby down, um, that is an isotonic contraction. If we sustain the isometric contractions, we're going to increase our blood pressure. And this could be a concern for people that have uh, already high baseline blood pressure. And this is why something like shoveling snow um, can be dangerous and can cause people to have heart attacks. 
Um, the tension and the muscle produces depends on its length. So fibers at resting length give the maximum force. There is optimal overlap of those filaments. The little head of the myosin is moving and flicking and you get them the maximum contraction. If the fibers are shortened, that's a weaker force. So if it's already close to the Z disc, it's not as strong. And then fibers extended have the uh, weakest force. That means that there'll be minimal thin and thick filament overlap. So when you contract um, from resting length, that's going to give you the most overlap of your thin and thick filaments. If it's already contracted a little bit and then you want to do more, that's going to give you a less um, tension. And then if it's stretched, that's the absolute least. You're not really overlapping those different filaments. So what is muscle fatigue? That's the reduced ability for the muscle to produce muscle tension. And this is going to be caused by decreasing glycogen stores after a long exercise. Other reasons you can have fatigue. Um, if you excite that neuromuscular junction and there's not enough calcium, that will decrease the synaptic vesicles. You can have excitation contraction coupling. That's when the ion concentrations do not allow for that action potential to move. And then cross bridge cycling, if you've got a lot of the phosphorus lying around, um, that is going to be slow to get an ATP binded to the myosin head. So we have less of that um, ability to have a contraction. So there are changes that happen as you exercise more and more. The first is that you will have endurance or you're able to better produce ATP. You get more mitochondria. Then you are able to have um, more time exercising without reaching that um, uh, point where you can no longer have muscle contraction. Um, and that resistance exercise can lead to hypertrophy where muscles increase in size. And that is because of them increasing their contractile proteins. Uh, muscle also will get more glycogen and more mitochondria. Lack of exercise can cause um, atrophy. That's a decrease in size. Um, like if someone's wearing a cast or they're bedridden, initially that's reversible. So like if you're wearing a cast or you've been told to stay off of your feet for a little bit, that's okay. Your muscles will atrophy, but then when you get back to moving around and doing things, it's reversible. Um, but it can become permanent if it's extreme. Um, so potentially someone who had use of their legs but then is confined to a wheelchair, there could be atrophy in which they can no longer, um, if they were able to get out of that wheelchair, stand, walk, move their muscles. With uh, aging, we also see um, an awful lot like with bone, we lose muscle mass as we age. This is a slow loss that starts in a person's mid-30s, usually just due to a decrease of activity, right? You're very active in your 20s um, and your teens, very sporty, doing a lot of things. But then in your mid-30s, you have a decrease of activity. We see a decrease in power, size, and endurance of skeletal muscles. There's a loss in fiber number and diameter, or we decrease our fibrils. We decrease oxygen storage and capacity. We decrease circulatory supplies um, to the muscles. There's a reduced capacity to recover from injury because our satellite cell numbers have decreased. 
We have fibrosis where we see muscle mass being replaced by dense regular connective tissue, so we lose flexibility. Um, so an interesting sort of clinical look here is at anabolic steroids, which is a substance that mimics testosterone. And um, it is illegal to use them without a prescription, but they are going to stimulate the manufacture of muscle proteins. And so, of course, it is a very popular uh, performance enhancing drug, um, but there are some very adverse side effects like risk of heart disease and stroke, kidney damage and liver tumors, testicular atrophy, breast development in males, acne, high blood pressure, very aggressive behavior and mood swings, and then growth of facial um, hair and menstrual irregularities in women. Okay, so that was all based on our skeletal muscles, but we don't just have skeletal muscle. We know that we have cardiac and smooth muscle as well. Good news is we are not going to spend nearly as much time there. Um, so here's some very basic things that you should know, um, starting with cardiac muscles. They are short branching fibers. They have one or two nuclei. They are striated, or we say that they contain those sacromeres. They have many mitochondria used in aerobic respiration. There's an area that we call intercalcated discs that join the end of neighboring fibers. And these discs contain desmosomes and gap junctions. Contractions are started by the heart's autorhythmic pacemaker. So when you hear of someone getting a pacemaker, it's really just re to replace a faulty natural pacemaker. Your heart automatically has this autorhythm to it. Um, and heart rate and contraction force are influenced by the autonomic nervous system. So you do not control your heart rate and contraction force. And here's what that looks like. It, it does look very different, right? These intercalcated -cal discs, um, the striations, looks different than our skeletal muscle. Then, of course, we have smooth muscle, which is found in a variety of organs um, that do a lot of different things in the body. Um, some examples in blood vessels to regulate blood pressure and flow, in the bronchioles to control airflow, in the intestines to mix and to move materials, in the ureters of the urinary system to propel urine from the kidney into the bladder, in the uterus, um, in the female reproductive system in order to contract, to give birth, as well as to shed uterine lining. Um, so smooth muscles are found all over the place in the body and play a very important role. They have a fusiform shape, um, so sort of pointy at the end and then wider in the middle. Um, and they are smaller than skeletal muscle fibers. Their sarcolemma has all kinds of calcium channels that depends on their, you know, what that muscle is needed for. They do not have the T-tubules. Instead, they have calveola, which are these little invaginations or like, um, I don't know, bends and folds um, to hold things instead. Um, they don't really have sarcoplasmic reticulum, um, but the outside of the cell is where you're going to find the calcium ions. So you can see here, um, see those little beds and folds? That's what we meant um, by that caviole. Um, but they are, are differently shaped, right? Tapered at the ends, wider in the middle. Um, and they are part of that autonomic nerve system as well. Um, a couple things here. The cytoskeleton has intermediate filaments in our smooth muscle. Um, there's going to be points where they interact with the sarcoplasm and points where they are interacting, excuse me, interacting um, on the inner sarcolemma. They have these contractile proteins that 
are there to sort of cause a twisting motion. And uh, these muscles don't have a Z disc, so they don't have any striations. They're smooth. Like skeletal muscles, smooth muscles do have actin, myosin, and troponin. But unlike it, the smooth muscle has filaments um, with myosin heads on their entire length. So they can form multiple cross bridges. Um, and they have that. Um, so they call that mechanism latch bridge instead. Um, and of course, they still have that calmodulin, which is what the calcium will bind with to trigger contraction. And then we have some enzymes that are going to be responsible for um, either giving the phosphorus or taking the phosphorus away from the myosin head. The steps are a little bit different, um, but for our smooth muscle, pretty much there will be this opening of those calcium channels. Calcium will go into the sarcoplasm and bind with calmodulin. We'll get this complex that will um, activate or start the myosin light chain kinase. That is going to give a phosphorus to the myosin head. We're going to make a bunch of different cross bridges that is going to pull on actin, um, but much more slowly than you would see if you were looking at the uh, uh, skeletal muscle. In order for it to relax, it's pretty much the opposite. We stop the stimuli. We get rid of calcium through uh, pumps in the sarcolemma. We are going to dephosphorylate the myosin. And then this can be slow to relax because of that latch bridge where we're making lots of connection to other muscles. With that, that means that we have a long latent period where it has a lot of time spent uh, to phosphorylate that myosin head. So we've got very slow ATP ACE activity. We have long duration. We've got slow calcium pumps. And this slowness is going to fit the requirements that it needs to do, right? So it's going to extend contraction and maintain a continuous tone, like the walls of our blood vessels. The good news is because of that property, they're fatigue resistant. Their energy requirements are rather low compared to skeletal muscles. And with that, we see um, that they can maintain their contraction without ATP because of that latch bridge. They're all connecting together. We have what we call a broad length tension curve. Basically, um, there's no Z discs. So the myosin heads present um, in the in the thick filaments, they can contract forcefully, even if they're at you know an already contracted fifty percent rate or at a an extended relaxed rate, which is great. Um, and what does that do? Well, if you think about it, you can empty your bladder regardless of the amount of urine that is in it because of this broad length tension curve. This is involuntary uh, control of these muscles. You're not normally thinking about it. Um, their response depends on the neurotransmitters and the receptors it has. So like, for example, the smooth muscles in your bronchial um, contract to acetylcholine and re relax for norepinephrine. Um, they, the response to stretch is different. They can have the myogenic response, which is that they'll actually contract when stretched, um, or a stress relaxation response, which is relaxation after a long stretch. Um, and of course, there's m many different smooth muscles in your body, so they have many different uh, stimulating factors like hormones, um, low oxygen, um, high CO2, drugs, pacemaker cells. There's many different things that could 
be stimulating these types of cells. We can have multi-unit or we can have single unit. Multi-unit smooth muscle cells are arranged individually. Those are going to be found like in your iris of your eye, the erector pili in your skin, in large passageways and airways. Um, that's where they will be found. Um, and then you can also um, find them in the walls of arteries. And their degree of contraction depends on the number of motor units, um, off, awfully like skeletal muscles. So they can have um, just a few of those motor neurons or they can have many. Um, then there is um, visceral smooth muscle. This is the most common type. And um, it's going to form two or three sheets um, in these hollow organs. They are located um, in the wall of the digestive, urinary, and reproductive tracts, most of the blood vessels. Um, and really, they are just going to contract in unison um, because of these gap junctions. Um, we say that there are um, varicosities, which is the swelling of these autonomic neurons. And usually they are either um, transmitting acetylcholine or norepinephrine. And the receptors are all throughout the sarcolemma. And basically numerous smooth muscle cells get um, stimulated at the same time. And because there are gap junctions, it is really stimulating them all together. And that's really just here that we've got this multiple um, location of releasing the, the trigger, the acetylcholine, the norepinephrine, and then um, it's binding. And because of these gap junctions, all of the, the cells are working together. Okay, so I know that that is a lot. So if you have questions, please feel free to um, reach out to me to look through the manual, to look through the um, different um, resources on the D2L. But otherwise, I thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day.